In 1909, just after ending his presidency, Teddy Roosevelt embarked on a year and a half long expedition to Africa. This was part hunting safari and part scientific exploration for the Smithsonian. When they reached Mount Kenya, Roosevelt was impressed. He said, through the bright sunlight, we saw in front of us the high rock peaks of Kenya and shining among them the fields of everlasting snow which feed her glaciers. Roosevelt's team was amongst the first to scientifically document the mammals of Mount Kenya. Roosevelt shot an elephant here and his team camped on the mountain for two months, taking notes, specimens, and photographs. However, their exact route up the mountain remained a mystery till in 2015 when our team matched historical photos from Roosevelt's expedition to physical landmarks of today. When we came over the ridge and we saw the lava cliffs in the distance, we knew we were in the right spot. We'd been scouting the mountain for months and we had finally found the place where they had pitched their camp and were able to map the rest of the route. We even found a sardine can next to a bear patch where they had pitched their tents in the old photos. While Roosevelt's expedition focused heavily on hunting, it provided invaluable biodiversity records through the specimens collected, many of which are preserved in museums today. These specimens are crucial for understanding the wildlife that was present in 1909. For our expedition, we traded guns for camera traps. The plan was to set cameras all along Roosevelt's famous elevational transect. That way we could see how species change along the trail. This would also provide a baseline for future studies as the planet warms and the mountain's equatorial glaciers continue to melt. Roosevelt's team used what is now known as the Burgerette Route up the west side of the mountain. This trail has rarely been used since, and the track becomes quickly overgrown. We could drive across the park boundary, but had to hike our cameras up the rest of the way. We had a simple yet challenging plan. Set a camera every 100 meters along the route, making this one of the most ambitious elevational surveys of mammals ever conducted. We threw in our packs and headed uphill, progressing through a series of habitat changes, leading from 2,300 meters up to the barren rocky outcrops above 4,600 meters. How would the animals change along the gradient? We're about to find out. In total, we got 219 cameras out along Roosevelt's route where they silently recorded the mountain's wild side. Our transect started outside Mount Kenya National Park in the community forestry lands. We captured a lot of pictures of livestock here, but none inside the park. And this shows how important these protected areas are in preserving natural landscapes for wild species. We also found a few low elevation species here that could survive in this agricultural land, but which we didn't detect further up, including reedbuck, hedgehog, and steinbuck. Also interesting that we had a lot of pictures of common diker down here, a species we would find later again much higher up the mountain. Crossing into the park, we are greeted by the magical old growth forest of giant podocarpus and juniperus trees. Here the livestock records abruptly stopped and we started seeing a great diversity of forest wildlife. Suni, one of the tiniest antelopes, was the most common species on our cameras. But the forest also had lots of beautiful bush buck, porcupines, and crazy looking bush pigs. Our cameras also picked up elephants and African buffalo here, two big species that we were happy to never actually encounter on foot while we were setting the cameras. As we camped at night in the forest, we struggled to sleep through the raucous tree hyraxes, a few of which came down to the ground and showed up on our cameras. The forest is also where we captured honey badger and aardvark, two secret species that have never actually been recorded on Mount Kenya before. The small carnivores were our favorites though, including genets, slender mongooses, a skunk-like weasel known as a zorilla, and the very rare Jackson's mongoose, which hadn't been recorded on the mountain since 1923. Our cameras helped reveal the great diversity of wildlife hiding in these dark forests, showing how important they are for conservation. Continuing up the trail, the giant trees gave way to the giant bamboo, amazing forests of Arundinaria bamboo that made you feel like you were walking through a living cathedral. A number of forest species continued into the zone, and the blue monkeys really took off, providing us with some pretty funny shots. As we climbed above the forest and bamboo, things got cooler, and we entered into a shrubby vegetation belt that also included some grassy and swampy areas. A lot of forest mammals started dropping out of the community here, but this zone still had lots of greenery and grass for herbivores, such as bushbuck, buffalo, and black-fronted diker. Our friend the common diker that we saw frequently just below the park boundary was also common in this shrubby belt after being absent from the forest and bamboo. Also in this zone, we got some amazing shots of serval that were up there hunting rodents in these grassy areas. The Afro-Alpine Zone is the most unique part of Mount Kenya. Here, amazing plants known as giant Senecios and giant Labolias create a world reminiscent of Dr. Seuss. We took a break here and slept in caves with impressive names like Highland Castle, but they weren't actually all that comfortable. 
The Afro-Alpine zone has cool looking plants, but there are also a lot of rocks here, and mammals can't eat rocks, so what animals did we find? As we worked our way up the mountain, our cameras detected fewer and fewer species. A lot of herbivores from the leafy areas below didn't venture into the Afro-Alpine zone. Instead, we found a new species, the rock hyrax, uniquely adapted to make the most of this kind of mountaintop habitat. We had also a few diker and eland that ventured into the Afro-Alpine zone, but didn't continue up into the rocks. Above 4,200 meters on Mount Kenya, and you are mostly walking through a rocky moonscape. There are a few herbs, grasses, and lichens hanging on, which only the rock hyraxes and hares could really take advantage of. We also got a remarkable record of a slender mongoose at 4,500 meters. This is 1,800 meters higher than has ever been recorded before. Could have been hunting hyrax? This was a beautiful but harsh landscape. It was great to hike through, but hard to stay at for extended time, unless you were a hyrax. We found two large predators on our cameras, leopards and spotted hyenas, and it was really interesting to see them use all the habitats on the mountains. These two generalist predators seem to be able to make a living anywhere, hunting monkeys and antelope in the forest and hyraxes and hares at the top. Other predators historically recorded on the mountain, like lions and African wild dogs, seem to have disappeared entirely. As the planet warms, all eyes are on Mount Kenya. Straddling the equator, everyone wonders if its glaciers can survive. Comparing the photographs from our trip with the exact same views from Roosevelt's team shows dramatic differences at the top of the mountain. But what happens below will be even more important. The slopes of Mount Kenya contain some of the most varied habitat types anywhere. Will they shift uphill with the warming temperatures? Will the 28 species of mammals we documented shift with them? Time will tell, and our camera trap pictures provide the baseline for this type of future work. The critical element in this story is that the protection of the Mount Kenya ecosystem is solid and unfragmented. This national park is providing exactly the kind of continuous and varied habitats that the animals will need to move up and down slope to adapt to climate change. Protecting mountain regions like this is critical to giving these amazing species the chance to adapt and survive on our rapidly changing planet. Thanks for watching this episode of Wild Animals. Uh, these results come from a new paper led by Matt that you can find linked in the bio. This trip to Mount Kenya in general was a huge effort and we really wanna acknowledge and thank the help of all our collaborators. Uh, we had funding from the Smithsonian Institution, from National Geographic, and we had huge amounts of support uh, from our collaborators at the National Museums of Kenya and the Kenya Wildlife Service. And also a big help to the porters and guides who helped supply us on the mountain and make the trip possible. We've got lots more discoveries, so be sure to subscribe. It's, it's gonna, gonna be wild. wild.